What's happening, everybody, and how the hell might y'all be hanging in there? Thanks for tuning in to the Crash Bang Boom Drumming Podcast for yet another episode. Today's guest is Greg Sonier of Deer Hoof. Greg and I get into the influence of the late great Charlie Watts, their new record, Actually You Can, as well as the 26 plus years of varying recording approaches, and our mutual stories about witnessing the madness and bombast of Brian Chippendale of Light and Bolt and Zach Hill of Hella, the Death Grips, and more. So I hope y'all dig it. Actually, you can will be available October 22nd, so keep your ears and eyes peeled. Today's episode actually has no sponsor, so if you're a drummer who's launching a website or have a pre-existing one you'd like to promote, or a drummer symbol company that'd be interested, or even a band that would want to promote themselves, hit me up at crashbangboompodcast at gmail.com and let's work something out. I will gladly read whatever you like, like an angel, albeit an angel with an ever so slight speech impediment. Crash Bang Boom Podcast can be found on iTunes Podcast, Spotify, Stitch, Luminary, Google Play, Podbean, and Amazon Music Podcast. Feel free to check out any of the previous 240 plus episodes and give me a like, a subscription, and or a positive review. Thank you to all the people that have been riding along all these years. It's five or six years. I don't even know at this point. All right, here we go. Greg Saunier. That's more French, right? Deer Hoof. Actually, you can. October 22nd. Crash. Bang. Boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, 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 yep. Yes! I'm here with Greg Saunier, depending on who you talk to. I tried to give it a French pronunciation or, or Saucier, according to you. Excellent. Très bien. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Saucier uh, of Deerhoof. Uh, put out no shortage of records over the years. Uh, keeping the wheels on, on, on the train all these years, somehow, some kind of way. We can talk about that. Uh, you got a new record coming out uh, called Actually You Can, I believe coming out in October. So... Uh, you recently moved. You're out in Tucson now. How, how long were you out in, in, in California or the L.A. Uh, San Fran area prior to moving there? The Deer Hoof started in San Francisco in 1994, and we stayed there till 2010. Then everybody moved. Four of us moved to four different cities, and that's how it's been ever since. And so what that means is that um last january um you know 2019 um no 2020 january we had the la our last show that we played that was the last time we've seen each other wow since january <laughs> of last year we have put out five albums and then we have another one coming in october like wow. <laughs> sometimes i think that uh, the band has gotten closer <laughs> since, since we don't have to be in the same minivan anymore you know right like yeah exactly since we're not you know in each other's faces a, a new level of uh, i think kind of love and care has you know come across Deerhoof's members that that was always there, but I think it's become more overt. I, 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 there's this sort of feeling of like you don't know how many more days you know you're going to be on this earth, and and uh, there's so many threats to not just a musician's livelihood, but to you know human existence yeah. um, on this planet. It was already happening even before the pandemic. There was just past a certain point. We'd, we'd all had so many experiences of every type of conflict in the band or um, every type of disappointment, you know, in, in, in so many years of playing that every day that we could do something together felt like some crazy gift. Yeah. Like this really shouldn't be happening. <laughs> right. We should have been done by now. Bands don't last this long. I know for real. And it's like it started to feel like it was really worth celebrating and that, that we just um, savored everything that we could do together. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, this one, this this actually you can is a bit like um, us not actually being able to meet and not having met for getting close to two years. Mm -hmm. um, but we did everything by email everybody has some kind of rec home recording setup mm -hmm. and um you know usually very simple but enough that we could simulate playing together mm -hmm. and create for ourselves the imagination that we're together 
And mm -hmm. so it's kind of a live record. It sounds like a live record. It's two guitars, bass and drums, vocals. Um, and it just is is a simulation of of how we feel when we play together, even though we can't. <laughs> yeah. Did it? Did did that process yield anything uh, in the form of writing or performance or any of it that's maybe unexpected, unexpectedly cool? I would hope. Yes, because it's like when we were able to get together, we would always say we should make a record that is like when we play. <laughs> and then we'd always start it and then it would always be like, well, let's just pile on a couple extra overdubs, you know, let's add some keyboards. Let, you know, it doesn't quite feel like what it feels like when we play together. Satomi, our singer and bass player this time was absolutely adamant, put her foot down and said, no, guys, we, it's going to be strict this time. There's no strings. There's no keyboards. There's no three guitars on one song. Mm -hmm. It's just... And she, she was absolutely insistent. And we were making everything, every, each one of us writes music and we were making demos at home. And, and everybody's demos, of course, had three guitars and keyboards and all this <laughs> yeah, stuff. Yeah. And, um, drum machines and all this stuff that we don't have in our live band. And so we had to, the, the surprise, at least for us, was to take those, to take demos and make them less fleshed out for the mm -hmm. finished album or find ways to, you know, if it's like harmonies, say, you know, how do you project, you know, a, a really complicated chord if you only have a certain number of strings to do it? Or how do you create this feeling of, of counterpoint um, of, of many things going on when you only have three stringed instruments playing those parts or something? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, everybody had to work hard on their part to, to kind of um, cover a lot, I guess. Yeah. And then come time to sort of get those songs to an arrangement point where y'all were all happy. Was it then the process that you had to go into a studio and track all the drums? No, everything was at home. All four of us were, were at home. I mean, what studio? I mean, I guess yeah. some studios were trying to operate, but no. Um, and it's, it's, it's funny, like you were asking a little earlier about like how have things changed since the early days of the band yeah. in terms of recording not that much because <laughs> like I recorded the drums with, I had a microphone that, that my bandmate John had given me once that he didn't need anymore on the bass drum. I had Satomi's old vocal mic on the snare drum that she'd replaced. I had an overhead and then I had a Radio Shack PZM on the floor huh. that was catching like the snare wires and stuff. Wow. Um, that was that was the mics. Um, I mean, I used a pretty small kit anyway. It's just one Tom snare kick, um, you know, and there's kind of no stereo image. Like I don't have like two symbols even. So right. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like, a, you know, a bit of a, yeah, I was just playing in my living room, you know, um, and uh, the other guys were largely just recording direct. You know, they just plug their guitars straight in and then send it to me. <laughs> and then, um, you know, we create simulated amp sounds and stuff and create the, the sense that we were playing together in the room. Yeah. Um, but, you know, honestly, for us, it was not that big of a change. We have been recording remotely for years right. because we have not lived together in the same city since 2010. Wow. Um, and so a lot of the albums that we've made since that time have been done somewhat this way mm -hmm. where, you know, people are recording things to you know at home on their own and right and emailing it around and, and then with uh with everybody having moved around uh since you said around since 2010 or so was then it a matter of will you work on these things uh the, the separate parts to make collectively what is the record and then it's time to get together and then rehearse i would imagine and then you're going out to 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 support to some degree right that question is kind of an intense one because one of the one of the tendencies that had started to you're getting this scoop on on your podcast only okay okay <laughs> <laughs> one of the tendencies that that crept into the dynamic of the band over 10 years of of not being in the same city and not having like 
twice weekly practice and get together and jam. There was no jamming in this band. We did not to get get together and write music together. It just that was not what was happening. It was yeah. like four separated songwriters making demo. Everybody plays all the instruments. And then you send this finished sounding thing to everybody else. And then you see if like, well, maybe I could replace that guitar with this guitar. Or I could do the drums over better. Or maybe not. Maybe the original <laughs> yeah. instruments just stay on there. And one thing that started to happen was, I think I started writing more of the songs that ended up on the record. Mm -hmm. I was more like, kind of like the last step I was doing more of the mixing, let's say, and the kind of like final arrangement. Mm -hmm. And it would end up that like, I'd be like, well, let me just put this guitar on here, you know? <laughs> let me just add some backup vocals. And it would end up, basically it became an unbalanced situation where my voice, with my creative voice within the four of us in the band was becoming stronger, was becoming more prominent in, in, in the music and this was a change that we, you know, gruelingly had to uh, work out and make. And that was one of the things that we decided to do differently this time, mm -hmm. is that we were absolutely insisting, with, uh, and, and me as well, um, insisting that the creative balance be more equal um, so that everybody is contributing to writing the music and everybody is on their instrument. So it's like the left guitar is Ed, the right guitar is John, I'm on drums, Satomi's on bass and vocals. And um, that's what you hear. It's, there's not, not any like fudging, the, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, well, I'm playing the guitar, but, or, or, you know, or anybody else playing the drums. I mean, on a lot of, a lot of our other albums, like a certain song, it'll be somebody else on drums. They, they're all three really good drummers. So yeah, they're all actually quite good. Um, <laughs> Ed, and, Ed and John both kind of, they play even more behind the beat than I do. You know, I, that, that's like a, a thing that I think is like maybe sometimes feels like a flaw in my playing, but they, they're like even more relaxed. Wow. Um, I think that it's like they, maybe they don't realize that like Ed, especially he's sort of a basher. And he, I think he when the, when he wants the snare to hit, he starts swinging. But from back here, and by the time it hits, it's like a little bit late. <laughs> Satomi is like dead on. She's definitely the most perfect drummer. In the Very band. Japanese of her. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's that. I, she just, it's sort of like her chance to correct all of the things about my drumming that she complains about <laughs> over the years of being so uneven and so out of rhythm and like right. inconsistent. Like she is like really solid. And yeah. uh, we, we had a song called um, Oh Bummer that's on La Ilo Bonita uh, where I play bass and she plays drums on the record and we were doing it on the tour. We've done it a lot live and nice. it's so fun to play along with a steady beat. Yeah. <laughs> and it must be such a pain to play along with me. <laughs> right. That's funny, man. I'm looking at the uh, poster over your left shoulder there and it was one of the records I was gonna ask you about oh, yeah. anyway. Uh, in Love Lore, uh, which is interesting, especially any time that I can see Ornette Coleman and Voivod referenced within a single song. <laughs> right so, on. So uh, <laughs> I'm assuming yeah. the idea was, uh, let's approximate a vibe of this artist into this artist into this artist and that becomes sort of the map of the song. Was that the concept there? We wanted to do medleys or mashups. Uh, it was for, we, we, we wrote it for a, it was like a commission for a new music festival. And we're like, oh great, we can play this festival. And then they're like, but you can't play your regular set. We are like, what? And it's like, this is like a year and a half from now is this festival. We're giving you all this time. You'd better think of a good idea. Wow. <laughs> and so we went over it for months with the person who was curating it, this, our friend Ben. And it's like, well, how about this idea? And he's like, good enough <laughs> wow and then you know he'd be like no i need you to like take some like avant-garde lp like orchestral piece from the late 60s and learn it note for note and we're like there's no way we're gonna do that like i'm yeah. the only person in the band that even reads music and it's <laughs> like forget it you know um <clears throat> we eventually hit on this idea of a kind of a concept uh, sort of performance that was all about music from the 50s to the 80s when the powers that be sort of sold us all on this idea that the human race was improving and culture was progress and we were 
reaching the point where soon poverty and disease um, were going to be eradicated and we were all going to be living on colonies on Mars and you know all of this and, and and there was there was so much it wasn't any one person's project it was it was a huge cultural space age thing that that sold us on this this fantasy you know that frankly could have come true but eventually the super wealthy found that other means were going to be more profitable than pursuing progress for its own sake, mm. pursuing equality or an end to racism or, you know, whatever it is, um, an end to hunger um, did not turn out to be profitable. It was more profitable to maintain racism and to maintain hunger. So we wanted to take all of this music that was about the future and was about progress. And some of them are very, you know, affirmative and you know like the theme from the jetsons or something is just about how it's all going to be you know living in capsules and stuff in, yeah. in the sky <laughs> and other ones were more like a little bit like darker like um you know a lot of the afro futurist uh, uh music that we were covering on there sun ra or parliament or electric avenue by eddie grant or something mm -hmm. you know takes this more cynical view like hey the future was supposed to be good but why is it not quite panning out the way that it was promised yeah. and so we were trying to mash it all together and and just see how these fragments of different pieces from all different styles of music might you know hit each other actually that that but so we did that concert and it was a live concert. And then the next day we recorded it in a tiny little studio oh. in Manhattan on Rivington Street. And during pandemic, I was like, I should go back to that recording. Let's mix it down. And that's when we put it out. And because of all the copyright stuff, since it's all covers, we just put it up for free. So it's up for free on Bandcamp. Uh -huh. And so for this record that's coming out in October, I think we, we wanted to continue this this like it's just two guitars bass drums all live there was something about that that we that satomi was especially was like no let's keep doing that you know mm -hmm. it sounds like y'all have made some efforts throughout time to minimize or simplify to some degree and then where kind of where you're at with the recording now and even looking at your kit having uh, started just with having more drums maybe at the time and now you've i saw uh, a show i believe that it was just you were just playing a uh, ride hi-hat snare and bass drum even. Yeah. So you've you've yeah, I've done that really really times. simplified. <laughs> uh, what it, what is it? Do you like the way that that forces you to think or approach differently? Yes. The the more there is, the the more I feel like um, can be a distraction. If a, if some toms are sitting there, I keep wanting to hit them. Sure. And then it's like something about the at least for me, you know, there are a lot of percussive traditions around the globe that involve a low sound and a high sound or a sort of loose tuned thing and then a really high tuned thing uh -huh. you know two drum sounds that are in constant dialogue with each other and i've always i don't know i just always found that to be really cool it's sort of the basis of you know the rock drum set is this sort of like there's the kick and the snare and they they kind of um you know go back and forth between each other and, and sometimes in some cases it'll be incredibly simple just one three one three one three mm -hmm. and then in other cases it'll be something more sophisticated you know like in james brown or right. or in jazz you know to become that conversation between the low and the high becomes quite intricate you know mm -hmm. um and i just found that that like if i didn't have more sounds to hit then i would have to come up with ideas instead of sounds, you know, I'd right. have to come up with something fun that a different way to try to grab the audience's interest. It would have to be because I played something cool instead of just I had a sound effect, you know, right, right, right. <laughs> Plus, it didn't fit in the minivan. We always just rent a minivan when we go up to her. <laughs> the stuff doesn't fit. You right. Know? That's wild, man. You're one of the you're a drummer that's been mentioned kind of alongside maybe but just because of the timing of when Deer Hoof came out and sort of what was happening in like the early 2000s with like Lightning Bolt and Hella. And mm -hmm. I remember seeing um, Lightning Bolt and Hella come through New Orleans at the time and kind of tripping out on both like the crazy unorthodox nature of Brian Chippendale with with uh, with Lightning Bolt. And then I saw uh, Zach Hill with Hella and I was like, wow, I, I don't even know who's more unorthodox. <laughs> what are your thoughts about your kind of association with those with those guys and sort of their bands it's funny because they're both very close personal friends of mine and i've done collaborations with each of them 
like basically drum duo records with each of them. Yeah. Brian is closer to my age. So we actually did start around the same time in the mid nineties. Yeah. Um, Zach is 10 years younger than me and did start in the early two thousands, which may seem like when Deer Hope started because it was when <laughs> we <laughs> started making maybe our first record that didn't completely bomb, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> right. we'd already been going for a while. Yeah. I always um, feel a little bit sheepish and uncomfortable when when being compared to them um, because I do not think that I'm anywhere close to them in terms of particularly the things that often get said about them first uh -huh. or the most, which is loud and fast. They are both. And uh, particularly fast. Yeah. But we played with Hella all the time because they were from Sacramento. So they were really close to us. We right. were in San Francisco. One time we were on tour or something. And we were on the same show on the same bill. And it was worked out, Zach, can I borrow your drums? Um, you know, just to make change over quicker. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd seen them a million times. I loved this band. I thought Zach was so fun to listen to. And he was very, very loud. And I just the drums always sounded really powerful and amazing. So his drums are up there. They've just played. They've done this set that just completely flattened the place. Then I go up and I'm like, OK, well, I can see that there's some stuff inside the bass drum and I want an unmuffled bass drum sound because um, that's part of my sound. So let me just, I'm going to go in and take this stuff out of the bass drum. I stick my hand in and it's the most disgusting thing I've ever felt. I realize it's all of his tour clothes Ugh. from the previous shows, all Ugh. sweaty, that nobody sweats as much as this man. Right. Until. And so immediately I retract my hand and say, okay, it's fine. We're going to have a muffled <laughs> kick drum sound tonight. Yeah. Then I go to start playing. He's got all these toms. And everyone has these huge dents. And I mean, it's like, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, it's like, you know, you, you hit this thing. It's like hitting this felt bucket hat. I mean, it made no sound at all. Yeah. Just I mean, it was so um, loose and dented that it made no sound. And the only way I could get a sound to come out of those toms was if I hit it, you know, I reached back behind my head and smashed the thing as hard as I possibly could, then you could hear it. And I realized, oh, that's what he's doing on every single note, you know, through the yeah. whole concert is he's whacking this thing so hard. <laughs> and when, when we ended up recording a record together called Nervous Cop, where we played as a duo, and actually we've done a couple now um, uh, in the early 2000s, um, my experience of playing with him was that we'd say, OK, go, and we'd both start. And I'd be bashing, and I'd be playing as fast and loud as I could. And at some point, I'd be like about three, four minutes in, I'd be like, I'd like stop for a second and realize that it sounded exactly the same whether I was playing or not. <laughs> because I was completely inaudible, and there was not even one millisecond between any notes where a, another drummer might be able to fit in some notes. <laughs> right. So I, I really learned a lot you know, about how to play along with someone like that. Um, well, there isn't anyone like that, but how yeah. to how to try and play along with a wall of sound. Um, yeah, you know, while while doing that. And it wasn't what I expected. And if I, I think what you say, you know, about how they're unorthodox, I think that that's the that's the part that's the most exciting and beautiful to me. Sure, about what they do more than the volume and the speed, because that's sure to decline like any athlete you know i mean that ages at some point right it's just an older body is not able to do the same thing that a younger body is and the the level of of just sheer physical force and energy is going to reduce right but see i th think they've set themselves up in a pretty good way because from their point of view it's not just about those you know sort of competitive volume and speed qualities. It's about, like you say, or unorthodox. So Brian will set up the drums in a really bizarre way. You know, totally. like one tom way over here, another one here. No hi-hat. Yeah, no hi-hat. He's not in a hi-hat and it's like ride cymbals broken. And, and uh, the, you know, I mean, anybody who sees, whether it's Lightning Bolt or Black Puss or, or anything that he does, you know, instantly has this very strong impression of, somewhat of an original 
personality and a kind of a rebel, you totally. know, someone who is inventing his own rules for for any kind of art. And he's also a great comic book artist and silk screener, and, and he makes his own clothes. And you know, I mean, he's you know a real original and, right. and self-made human being. And that's the part that I think the inspiration that can come from that doesn't die out as you get older. And it it inspires you whether you're a drummer or whether you're anything, you mm -hmm. know. And it, I think that it, that's beautiful. Absolutely, man. Uh, and thinking about sort of any unorthodox drummers or maybe just drummers uh, that had a particular energy that preceded some of the guys that we're talking about. I mean, I've always kind of pointed a little bit to Keith Moon and sort of the, the wildness uh, and the unpredictability, seemingly, that he interjected into The Who, which, if it weren't for him, to me, to my ear, I feel like The Who could be a fairly boring band, but yet you 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 put this wild card into the chemistry, and then you get this whole different thing, similar to what somebody like like maybe Brian or Zach could have an effect on a band that way. So, you know... And I think it's humor, humor and shock. Absolutely, you know? yeah. absolutely. I just think, yeah, I mean, for him, you had a sense of how maybe wild... And, and again, his sense, uh, his comedic sense and everything, yeah. and it was embedded in his playing. And that's not like the easiest thing to convey via the drums necessarily. I don't think you can fake it because I don't think you can fake it. You have to have, it, 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 it is an element of their personality. Um, it comes out in different ways for each of them. They are not identical to each other, yeah. but they both have an element inside them that is destructive you know and i think that keith moon it was the same thing it's a, a sense of wanting to destroy as much as keith moon is beautifying pete townsend's songs by adding so much flourish and so much power to like what you say would be kind of a you know two chords you know a sort of very simple um riff that repeats but keith moon makes it seem very important like it's some life-ending, earth-shattering kind of, you know, statement uh, with this A chord and this G chord mm -hmm. um, becomes like, you know, a religious experience when he's dressing it up so much. And I think that it's both the beautification of it, but also the destruction of it. There was always sure. this, uh, this demonic side, um, obviously, to Keith Moon. I'm not saying anything that any drummer doesn't already know. Right. Um, but, you know, the, the willingness to also bring the song to the brink of 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 collapse you know and um and to you know it, it, and i never saw the who live um with keith moon but i did i have seen zach and and uh, brian play uh, zillions of times live and it's un obviously an unmistakable energy i mean there's the sticks are breaking all over the place stuff yeah. is falling over <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> um your ears are are breaking oh yeah you know, amazingly, you know, they're both incredibly soft-spoken, very kind, very gentle souls um, when you're friends with them. There is an energy, a kind of kill energy that is hard to describe um, without giving the wrong impression. But I, I really feel that, that there is a a battle-like or slaughter-like energy and that I think is somewhat inherent, you know, in, in a lot of drummers, whether or not they're quite as spectacular as those two um, or as foregrounded as those two. I do think that playing the drums is a, is a very wonderful way that human beings, um, since before history was ever recorded, have been channeling certain types of if not violent energy, the impact energy of things hitting things, of you know? Um, and that's the way that sound is produced on percussion instruments is by striking them. Yeah, man. And that the, the resistance there, you know, when, so, when, when a drum bounces back, it's sort of like it, it's, it's, it is like a boxing or, or, or something that, that, um, that some, people get a great pleasure from that resistance and from that slightly feeling like like I'm I've never been in a fight in my life with anyone but but I do feel and I don't want to be but <laughs> yeah. I do feel attracted to hitting the drums and 
alternating between smashing or caressing, you know, the drums and 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 all of the different feelings, ways that things could be touched, um, can be played out and performed physically via, uh, you know, playing the drums and yeah, and uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, the Keith Moon thing. I definitely learned to play drums somewhat by playing along with with Who records. Interesting. Um, yeah. I had Quadrophenia, and like the first loud song on there is um, "The Real Me," and that one's just like like a funk beat basically with just nonstop fills. And it, like <laughs> yeah. I pretty much like learned to play the drums by playing along with that. But wow. But I have to say, I have to say, in response to what you're talking about about unpredictable because he just died the person that i really played along with and the person that i considered my real drumming hero was charlie, charlie watts, watts who is like the opposite of brian and, and Zach. totally like the most understated you know seemingly repetitive not athletic playing pretty quietly totally. you know traditional grip light touch um unassuming not looking for the spotlight no drum solos no crazy fills never could really play that fast nevertheless you know it was 1982 for me so i i bought tattoo you it was the first record i ever bought with my own money and i listened to start me up over and over again all the songs on there on that record and and uh the thing is if you listen in the background to the rolling stones the drums seem very predictable uh -huh. the snare's always on two and four you know it's just the rock beat you know you listen closely the way I did when I was 12 or 11 or whatever it was. Um, and you're trying to figure out every little detail of like this time he opened the hi-hat this one time. I'm trying to copy it. I'm trying to learn to play the drums. Yeah. You know, this one fill, you know, the, 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 where does he hit the cymbal crash and where does he not hit the cymbal crash? And I realize it's completely unpredictable. It's subtle. But it's totally unpredictable. And he, what he does is he he's listening to Keith Richards. He's listening to Mick Jagger. He's reacting. He's punctuating what they do. Mm -hmm. And Mick Jagger will sing a phrase and then he hits a cymbal. It's not every four bars he does a, a, a fill and then he hits a cymbal. Sure. It's like when he feels that there's something. <laughs> basically, I almost think of it like when he feels that, like, say, Mick Jagger kind of slightly biffs, you know, a line um, and it's not, it needs a little something extra to sell it. That's when he, that's when he puts a smash, you know, right afterwards to kind of like, to, 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 to like, like you're playing in a big band or something like that. Like right. it, it needs that kick, you know, it needs the thing to, to sort of, to put the exclamation point at the end of, of somebody's something, you know? Right. And uh, and that isn't predictable. It's quite loose and improvised. And even though it's not flashy, I am very sure, and I became more sure this week than ever, you know, how much my playing personally, you know, comes completely from Charlie Watts. Right. And and maybe not just Charlie Watts. When when I play in ways that are not like Charlie Watts, I think I'm playing like Keith Richards, and I'm making my band play like Charlie Watts and be Charlie Watts for me to be more syncopated and more ragged you know yeah. um, but it's that dynamic between you know someone trying to hold it and give space for someone else to be ragged and then then maybe alternating roles you know yeah. that's what happens a lot in deer hook yeah man before charlie uh passed i uh i had been really obsessing over the sticky fingers record and the final song on that record the last song is uh, Moonlight Mile. And, yeah, that uh, one's I epic. Think, I think that's one of the most, I mean, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to point to a more beautiful song that they wrote. And they wrote a lot of beautiful songs, but something about the strings, the spaciness, the way that it starts off, the way that it builds, everything in between. Moonlight Mile is a great example. I mean, in a way, it's not so different from the way I was describing Ed Rodriguez, my guitar player, when he plays the drums. The only time that Charlie ever really lifts his arms you know, normally he's got his right arm on the hi-hat and his left arm on the snare. And it's like, it, it'll go up an inch, right. you know? And he's like, he's on traditional grip with his left hand. And he's just like barely, he's just flicking his wrist. His arm doesn't even move. <laughs> the only time you see he, he start to swing arms is when he hits toms, uh -huh. particularly if it's a big fill. 
There's one in the middle of you can't always get what you want. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, that they that they always play at concerts. Moonlight Mile is one that they don't play that often now, right. but you can hear it on the record. That's when he's swinging his arms, and when he does those big tom things, he's always behind. And that's and and Daryl Jones, their current bass player. Um, I read an interview with him once where he was describing what it was like. He's like, it seems like Charlie's behind, but I just keep going. I keep going in the same tempo. And when that fill is over, he's always right back on. Uh -huh. um, but the thing is, when he swings his arms, the, it, he plays pretty behind the beat anyway. He's yes. quite behind the beat, yeah, which is sure. exactly how I play, um, particularly with the left hand. Well, really with both, but... but uh, um, but when he's doing those tom fills, it's really like all bets are off. <laughs> like, yeah. The, and uh, when you hear Moonlight Mile, it's it's very unmachine like on the on the toms. Absolutely. And uh, it's just this trying to create this epic feeling, you know, that uh, that you can tell that he's like playing from his emotion, you know, and not from anything technical. He's completely self taught, um, which I am as well on the drum set. And uh, just very has his own quirks, you know, from the way that he played for decades without, you know, and they were so successful so quickly. <laughs> nobody ever told him, hey, you can't play like that. It's, I'm sure. Charlie Watts. I'm in the Rolling Stones. But I'm, this is how I play too bad, you know, and nobody would ever like correct him. And so you get have it for an entire life, you know, over 50 years right. of a music career of this. You know, if you listen closely, quite a quirky style, you know, very self-made, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, again, like you said, I think that's a, a great correlation is that his sort of funky style was most certainly, and Keith Richards would say the same. I think those two informed each other, and Keith certainly had that style and his rhythm and his whole sense. And so that's that's just – it's that – that chemistry connection between he and Keith was always like at the musical center of what made them the Rolling Stones musically so cool in many instances, you know? Yep, totally. Absolutely, man. Uh, well, what what age did you get your first drum set? It sounded like you were, you mentioned it earlier that your, your first record that you were playing along to. Ah, uh, yeah, so I must have had one by then. Although maybe I didn't. I think I was air drumming when I first got Tattoo You. Okay. I was in school band playing snare drum. So oh, okay. I, I was trained in the sense that I knew how to hold drumsticks uh -huh. and I could read music. Um, but I was never trained on drum set to be yeah. like a rock drummer or a jazz drummer or anything. Um, I, it was probably a year later or something like that. I was just so into it, and it was so obvious that I was like into the Rolling Stones. Uh -huh. <laughs> that it was like there was no turning back. And right. you know, I was lucky. I was lucky. My parents, you know, they supported this. Uh, you know what was you know as any drummer knows uh, a, a very uh, noisy pursuit. Um, Big time. Uh, that the neighbors don't like, and the nope. family or who else lives in the house is often they don't like, like it. I don't know if I really like I'm encouraging the right thing here, you know? Yeah. And to this day, it's like I still get uh, I mean, we'll see. It's been a while since we've toured now, but I certainly remember at our last show, I still getting dirty looks, <laughs> particularly from Satomi, like, Greg, why are you playing so loud? <laughs> I can't hear myself sing, you know? It's like this band has gone for like 26 years at this point, and I'm still, I mean, she'd been in it since 1995. Yeah. And still, like, after every show, it's like, that show is pretty good, but Greg, do you have to play that loud? Do you have to, like... Do you have to do those moonlight mile fills? You know, it's like, do you have to be so bombastic? You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think that that's part of the <laughs> dynamic, which makes the band interesting. You always kind of have that sound, both in the way you play and the way you record the drums on the records. And then that juxtaposed with everything else that's going on. It's all uh, a, a bizarre and, and absolutely left field chemistry uh, that goes down. But that's all part of it. So, I mean. I, w I wouldn't change it, but then again, I'm a loud fucking drummer. Okay, so. I'll let her know. I'll let her know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jody Smith on the Crash Bang Boom podcast said that I don't need to play any softer. Exactly. <laughs> I've oh. done everything I can do. I, I bought the quietest symbols I can find. Uh, you know, uh, I'm using hi hats that are, you know, 18 inches or 20 inches or something, trying to get a lower, less piercing sound, uh -huh. um, dark sounding everything. 
and um, really tiny sticks and all this stuff just like is there anything I can do to make myself put out a little less volume but uh, just a basher you know when when they start really rocking you know when they start sounding good I can't help it yeah you know? I, I, hear you. I I am so inspired by what my bandmates play that I just lift off you know and I think that's a thing that does come from Charlie he did not listen to himself he was not listening to the drum part he was like listening to them and when they did something good he was like yes and he would feel that surge you know right. it was like a surge of energy and that's what I'm always like feeling with oh, my yeah. bandmates absolutely I mean that's that's the way that you would hope that it would go uh one question for you, uh, Oberlin College. I know that you went there. I know a couple of the guys, John McIntyre of Tortoise, John Theodore of uh, Mars Volta, Queens of Stone Age, et cetera, Golden when I originally saw him. Did you learn to play additional instruments when you went there? Because it sounds like you started uh, in school band, started picking up drum set, and then... I didn't know John Theodore. I, he's a younger generation, so I actually didn't even know that he went to Oberlin. And I don't know what he did at Oberlin, but I right. do know John McIntyre was not even in the conservatory. He No, he was. He studied electronic music. That's oh, what he was studying. Interesting. I was studying music composition. Neither of us took any drum lessons or did any percussion in the school interesting. When, when we were there for four years. We both played in bands on campus. <laughs> <laughs> we were like the two competing drummers. He was exactly my age, I think. And so interesting. Um, we were always like... He was always the coolest drummer on campus, for sure. Um, and then I was like, you know, maybe like sometimes if I, on a good day, I was like second coolest. Yeah, <laughs> uh, um, yeah we the, the, the band that I had um, at Oberlin was called Split Jimmy. And it was a kind of early grunge band. This was in the late 80s or around 1990. Yeah. Um, I'd never heard of grunge. My bandmates were the two guitar players were not in the conservatory. They were into this new thing called grunge. They loved this band, the Melvins. Um, I'd never heard any of it. Um, they just would play me these heavy riffs and I would just sort of like try to do whatever Charlie Watts would do along with it. <laughs> I was starting to listen to Tony Williams a lot during college too. Oh, so yeah. I tried to like put in Tony Williams stuff. There you go. And um, that band, you know, we graduated and it seemed to be the end. But then the, those two guitar players ended up moving like me to San Francisco, to the Bay Area. We started playing again in San Francisco, and we, we, we made a different name for the band. It was called Niter Pit. I was going to Melvin's shows. The Melvins happened to live in San Francisco at the time. Yeah. It was a brief period in the early 90s when they were located there. I would see every show that they played. They were my absolute favorite band, and wow. Bill was my favorite drummer. Um, and I was so inspired by, by it. Was like, it was like... I'd get chills if I'd see him walking down the street, you know, <laughs> like it was a real like uh, he was a real celebrity to me. Wow. And we were trying to be heavy. And at that time that I was also trying to play as loud as I possibly could, inspired by Dale. And I and I again felt the same feeling that I had with John McIntyre and that I sort of ended up feeling with Brian Chippendale or Zach or whoever. It's like I'm never going to be as good at doing them as they are at doing them. Sure. So why do I even bother? <laughs> and so I've tried to find other ways to create heaviness in this band Niter Pit. And I, I started to, you know, I don't know, just slowly piece together this style of, of like playing out of rhythm a lot, you uh -huh. know, as another way to create tension and intensity in the music. That band, Niter Pit, those two guitar players ended up suddenly quitting the band. Uh, suddenly, one day, we still had shows booked. <laughs> and so it left me and this guy, this bass player, that they found, you know, on the street somewhere or whatever. And it was suddenly just me and this guy, Rob, bass and drums. We've got shows. And so we just went ahead and kept playing the shows. Um, just the bass part and the drum beat. Yeah. <laughs> With without the without the like main riffs or whatever, and we just kept doing it. And eventually, we we called it Deerhoof, and that's how Deerhoof formed. So it actually goes back to Oberlin. It actually does. Um, that's wild. It, it's, it connects directly to Oberlin. Damn. But yeah, John McIntyre and I, neither of us were percussion, you know, majors or anything. We did it more as hobbies. I was studying writing music. I was doing like classical music, you know, modern classical music. Yeah. And then in, in doing that, you picked up some other instruments that you inevitably learned how to play along the way? No, I didn't. Um, I already 
knew how to play guitar somewhat. I mean, as much as I do now, which is, you know, pretty rudimentary, but yeah. I love playing the guitar. Um, so I, I had taken piano lessons when I was a kid, so I've always played piano nice. or keyboards or whatever. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't, uh, I was not focused on instruments while I was there. Interesting. And neither was John. Yeah. He was focused on recording and electronic music. He was getting into synthesizers and like consoles and tape machines and stuff like that. Right. Uh, another band that I would wanted to ask you about, uh, there is a project that you've done with Mike Watt and Nels Klein, right? Yeah, and uh, Nick Reinhardt. Big Walnuts Yonder. Big Walnuts Yonder. That name <laughs> yeah. is hilarious. <laughs> that was a that was a Wattism. Of course it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. I love it that you played. It's, I, I'm not too familiar with with the uh, the third guy that you mentioned, but of course Mike Watt and, and Nels Klein. And man, both Nels is such a, a super interesting uh, guitarist as well. Like uh, obviously, I can from my perspective that he seems like someone who has who knows a lot technically about the instrument, but he also, oh again, goodness. very yeah. unorthodox player. Of course, Mike Watt's been a badass since he was a little kid. Like, that's that's cool, especially those two guys in particular. I would love to jam with those two guys. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was like. I had played with Nels before. Um, he and I had been friends for a while, and actually it was, <laughs> it was Nels <laughs> who forced Mike Watt to come uh, to a Deerhoof show one time in about 1998. Wow. Uh, and uh, Watt hated us. He thought <laughs> we were absolutely horrible. But then, like, Nels kept, like, saying, no, you got to listen to these guys. Um, and and at some point, I don't know, Watt changed his mind, and he, he became a, a fan. And then Nick Reinhardt um, was another guitar player. His band is Terra Milos, okay. um, a prog band. Yeah. Um, he has a duo, an improv duo with Zach Hill. They're oh. both from Sacramento. Crazy. One of the greatest performances I've ever seen was them opening for Deerhoof one time in San Francisco with Zach Hill and Nick Reinhardt. Really? <laughs> just doing, I forget what they called themselves, but it was just straight improv. And, and Nick has a whole lot, like Nels has a lot of pedals, but not compared to Nick. Wow. Like he has the, he's got the whole story, you know? <laughs> and... Uh, just the craziest noises you've ever heard. Just so loud. And Zach just going for it. It just relentless energy. It was a really, really beautiful. Um, and uh, so Nick wanted to do a project with Watt. And I guess what it was, was he was like, and also, could you introduce me to Nels Klein? Yeah. And Watt was like, well, the best way for you to meet Nels Klein would be to play with him. Why don't we, why don't we all three of us do a project? Yeah. And then Watt was like to Nick was like, and you can pick the drummer. And Nick was like, well, I want to play with Greg. Amazing. Uh, and so then they called me up and then it took about three years for all of our schedules <laughs> to clear enough that we had one weekend. Oh, wow. To get together and record the whole thing. And uh, um, it was a serious bro out. Uh, it was like <laughs> not something that I was used to, but we, we really broed out for about two or three days. Amazing. And just, it was very... Um, Unlike what I was used to in Deerhoof, where we never go into a recording studio and we always just take as much time as we need instead of, you know, what we lose in fidelity, <laughs> you know, and equipment quality, uh, we gain in time. Uh -huh. So we, we just might take months to record and re-record and re-record things um, and remix it and remix it a zillion times until it finally pleases everybody in the band. Uh -huh. This big nut walnut, big walnuts yonder thing was like the opposite. It was like the red light is on, the clock is ticking. Oh yeah, you're paying money and like you better nail it. And so I actually felt like, like I didn't really play that well on on that record. Like I, I felt like, oh man, I could have really used some more passes at some of those things. You know, I didn't uh -huh. quite nail it the way I wanted to. Um, but it was like, no, we got to move on. It was like a, it was a real learning experience for me to. It was like a session, you yes. know, and I was really like not used to that kind of pressure. Like the Deerhoof bubble has been a really forgiving, <laughs> very forgiving um, bubble. You know, my right. bandmates humor me to the nth degree, you know. Nice. I have certainly a bizarre drum style that they, you know, they <laughs> allow me a lot of leeway. <laughs> right. Totally, man. Excellent. <laughs> Well, man, Greg, it was fun talking to you, dude. I appreciate catching up uh, finally. I've been wanting to talk to you for some time, and, yeah, lo looking forward to the new record. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to stay in touch. Enjoy Tucson. 
Yeah, thanks so much, and, and have fun over there in Salt Lake City. Absolutely. Enjoy the mountain, mountain views. You know it. <laughs> I appreciate the questions. Thanks so much for reaching out to do the interview. Yeah, man. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Thanks to Greg for hanging. Definitely cool talking with him about the late, great Charlie Watts and having a little bit of a tribute, which was definitely an unexpected gem, as well as getting his insight into uh, the influence, which I was actually not aware of prior to that. But definitely apropos and couldn't have been a better time having recently passed. Moonlight Mile, baby. That's the jam. Crash, bang, boom. Boom.